actually I have a very uh, interesting Zod Hashem Dvar Torah that actually starts with a uh, question. As a matter of fact, it's a question that uh, somebody asked. Uh, so, um, but it's also connected to our parasha, and it's connected to last night's shiul. It's connected to a lot of things. Besiyat Dishmaya, we'll try to do our best to uh, keep the time uh, to around an hour before we start taking your other questions. But Bezal Hashem, I think that once you hear some of the uh, things, uh, you may not even want to ask questions because you'll be dumbfounded at how extraordinary and endless our Torah is, Baruch Hashem, uh, how everything is in it. As the Mishnah in Avot says, Afochba ve'afochba dekulaba. Delve into it and delve into it because everything is in it. So the, uh, the question is, uh, if somebody did something bad to me, am I allowed to, to hate him? Now, everyone knows the answer is uh, no. You're not allowed to hate because we have a uh, mitzvah in the Torah. It says that uh, you have to love another Jew. You're not allowed to keep a grudge and so on and so forth. Uh, but at the same token, we have a Gemara that says that if he specifically did something bad to you, such as take money, then you're allowed to hate him as long as he... Uh, has not returned the money. So it's not exactly such a simple mitzvah. There's other details to it that we're going to get into. There's other details to it. Uh, are we allowed to take revenge? Well, it all depends. What did you do? What did he do? And so on and so forth. So last night, in the uh, shiur last night, we uh, brought a chidush by the Chatam Sofel, who uh, brings a gemara in Masechet Nedarim, where the Gemara asks, how come, how come the Torah scholars of that day, uh, although they were scholars, their children were not scholars? Because normally you would assume that someone that has, someone that's a scholar and dedicates their life to Torah, their children should also be scholars, but that wasn't the case. And the Gemara brings a rebuke on the sages of that day, uh, the, those scholars of that day, uh, and says that because they didn't bless the Torah. They didn't bless the Torah. So then the Khatam Sofer says, what does it mean they didn't bless the Torah? They didn't do a blessing? No, it doesn't mean that. It means that they used the Torah, those sages in that time, used the Torah in order to beautify their own personal world, but not necessarily uh, do a fulfill the Torah in order to sanctify Hashem's name, in order to do the Torah for uh, for the because it's the will of Hashem, because they misunderstood one of the statements in the Torah, which is that you uh, have to uh, love uh, you must love uh, your uh, brother like you love yourself, and uh, this is the klal gadol uh, Torah. This is a big uh, teachings in the Torah. It's a big rule in the Torah, and they in essence like unfortunately many do today, have turned that into the entire Torah instead of a big rule in the Torah. And there's a very big difference between this being the entire Torah and this being a big rule in the Torah. We're going to get to the reason, Bezat Hashem, of why, uh, what does it mean to be a big rule in the Torah? And uh, because at the end of it all, the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat says that HaKadosh Baruch Hu did not create the create the world other than the for reason for the reason of us to fear him so in essence telling us that if a person learns Torah does mitzvot and learns how to fear a Kadosh Baruch Hu, he has fulfilled his purpose but if he doesn't even if he knows the entire oral Torah and written Torah by heart but he does not have fear of the Almighty it's Better off he didn't do anything. It's as if he did nothing. He'll get punished even for his Torah. Why? Because Yirat Hashem, Iotzaro. The fear of the Almighty, that's his treasure. So in essence, it tells us in many places, Gemara Masechet Shabbat, Masechet Abu Dazarah, and many, many other places, that the fear of the Almighty is the, uh, the main treasure. It's the main purpose in the world. Uh, and uh, there is no such thing as sanctifying Hashem's name without fearing Him first. And many people confuse this, but they say, wait a minute, but why should I fear when, uh, you know, it, it sounds so scary when really I could go to a much nicer version that uh, some other, uh, you know, a uh, care bear type of uh, uh, teacher 
is uh, telling me that I should just love everybody, you know, be a, uh, you know, uh, lovey-dovey, kumbaya, whether you violate Shabbat and is mar intermarried and eats pig. That doesn't matter. I should love him anyway because he's a Jew. Shouldn't I just listen to that? It sounds much nicer. Torah says, no, you're not allowed to do such a thing. And the care bear rabbi should also do tshuva with you because he's misteaching you. He's misunderstanding the Torah. And the, uh, the Gemara says that the uh, Nechatam Sofer brings this chidush, and it's actually quoted in a few places by the Chatam Sofer, that uh, this is the reason why the sages got punished at that time, because they misused the Torah, and in essence used the Torah in such a way that it was just to beautify their own personal lives and not necessarily to sanctify Kadosh Baruch Hu's name. So even scholars... Uh, and we're not talking about the scholars that, uh, you know, are, are, are uh, uh, the greatest sages in history, but, you know, a certain a, uh, scholars at that time can make mistakes, can make mistakes. And uh, many people do make these mistakes where they read something and they don't look at the entire teaching. They just look at one single statement and make a conclusion based on that single statement. And nine out of ten times you're going to arrive at the wrong conclusion. Uh, because the Torah is a uh, uh, endless, endless uh, well, uh, where if you learn the different aspects of different things, you'll see that there's a lot more to everything. It's not nothing is concluded with a single statement. But with that being said, uh, people have made the mistake in the past, even though when there were scholars, people are making that mistake in this generation, so much so that the wicked uh, Rabbi in Efrat. Uh, um, Riskin that we talked about uh, recently that is uh, creating all types of uh, mamzerim in the world and all types of desecration of Hashem uh, his Talmid Brandis uh, he uh, just uh, uh, was quoted in an article where he's proud to announce of his uh, appointment of the new chief orthodox rabbi of a certain shul in Efrat in Israel, a woman. A woman, she's religious, uh, there's no question about her religiosity as far as whether she keeps Shabbat or not, but to say that a woman is going to be the chief rabbi, in so many words, of a synagogue, nothing like that has ever happened in the orthodox world, nothing ever like that will happen in the orthodox world, and so, but we just quoted something. They're not orthodox. They reform, but they like to call themselves orthodox. Just like my dear friend from the Iguda Rabbanim told me in the old days, it was very simple. If you are reform, you call yourself reform. If you are a conservative, you call yourself conservative. If you are orthodox, you call yourself orthodox. Today, the reform call themselves orthodox and the orthodox call themselves orthodox. You have no idea what's going on until you see what, uh, what people are doing. And it's unfortunate. But uh, this is this whole expression of love to this woman that is leading now a keilah in Eretz Israel is a distortion of this very same thing that we talked about yesterday, which is to love everybody, and that's the whole Torah. It's not the whole Torah. It's a big rule in the Torah, but it's not the whole Torah. In fact, there's even a mitzvah to hate certain people, them specifically, because they're violating the Torah. But there are certain things you're not allowed to do. So this is some of the things we're going to go into today, Bezat Hashem. Who you're allowed to hate, who you're obligated to hate even, who you're not allowed to hate, who you're, uh, you're obligated to love, and so on and so forth. And what, what does it really mean to, uh, to, uh, to love another Jew? What does it really mean? So in this week's parasha, in this week's parasha, Rabotai, it's I'm going to give you a chidush that uh, I don't believe anybody has, uh, has heard before, at least not my audience, because um, I have only learned it recently. This week's parasha has mitzvot in it, has interesting things in regards to tum'ah, tara, the purity, impurity, but then there's the famous story at the end of this week's parashat Emo which is the story of the blasphemer. The blasphemer who uh, was, is known as a person that was the son of Shulamit. Shulamit is the woman that uh, in Egypt was a very uh, bubbly person, let's say flirtatious person, imadist person, 
and uh, would say hello to everybody, including the Egyptians and uh, Kadosh Baruch who punished her that because she was imadist in that aspect, not imadist in clothes, there was virtually no imadist among the Jews uh, as far as clothing in those days. Uh, that's an invention, invention of, of, of the last hundred years. But uh, rather her attitude was immodest, which unfortunately a lot of uh, women till this day are very immodest with their attitude and they're hello to everybody, goodbye to everybody. They have uh, guy friends. Uh, you know, I'm just calling my friend. Who's your friend? Steve. Well, you have a male friend? How, how, how does that work? No, it's a platonic relationship. Maybe an atomic relationship, not platonic. There is no platonic relationship, male or female. It's an atomic relationship. Either he's forbidden to speak to because he is obviously the opposite and he's interested in you or will be interested in you or you're interested in him or he's interested in another him, which is another reason why you should not talk to such a person like that. But nonetheless, people do whatever they want and uh, they're, uh, they're always going to find some care bear rabbi to tell them that it's okay and it's allowed and it's even a mitzvah uh, to do some type of sin that they're doing. But nonetheless, this Shulamit was a sinner in a sense that she was flirtatious, bubbly, and uh, would say hello to everybody. One day, one of the Egyptians uh, got a hello and thought that she was interested in him, and automatically that made that beast uh, that he already was uh, come out, and he ended up uh, raping her. And uh, when uh, her husband found out and, and in essence uh, walked in on the situation uh he started beating her husband uh to a pulse almost to the extent of killing him and that's when moshe rabbeinu saw it he saw the egyptian beating the jew he also saw Beruach HaKodesh, uh that uh what actually transpired that it's really the egyptian as usual being the evil one here uh and uh, he killed him he killed the egyptian so now from that act from that act many other things many other fruits although rotten fruits fruits came out of that uh, whole act the whole issue of the tan v'aviram which were uh, the husband and the brother of shulamit they ended up fighting the next day moshe rabenu rebuked them they ended up going to paro who uh, uh tried killing moshe rabenu after that moshe rabenu fled egypt for the next 60 years before coming back and rescuing Am Yisrael. So here we see the first evil deed of Datan Ve'aviram. Uh, furthermore, a child is born out of that rape. That child is mentioned many weekly por- uh, Torah portions later, an entire book later, in Parashat, in a parashat Emor, in Sefer Vaikra, this week's parasha. In uh, chapter 24, where it talks about how there was the uh, uh, the son of the Israelite woman went out and he was the son of the Egyptian men. And he went out among the children of Israel. And uh, they quarreled in the camp. And the son of the Israelite woman and the Israelite man, they quarreled and the, uh, the, he uh, got upset that the uh, Jewish people they, they, uh, did not accept him into the tribe of Dan because although his mother was a tribe of Dan, the tribe is decided by the father. And since his father was an Egyptian, they did not accept him into any tribe because he was not part of any tribes. And he got into a quarrel with them. Uh, uh, some of the Mephashim say that it got physical. And uh, then... They brought him to a Bedin. They brought him to Moshe Rabenu. They brought him to Moshe Rabenu. Moshe Rabenu tried the case, and that's why it says, and the son of the Israelite woman went out. What does it mean, went out? He went out of the Bedin. He went out of the Bedin of Moshe Rabenu after receiving the news that he is part of no tribe until Mashiach comes. Because he doesn't come from a Jewish father, even though he's a Jew. Uh, because his mom is a Jew, but he's not part of any tribe. This is the same thing with when it comes to converts. Converts are not part of any tribe. The Mashiach, Tzidkenu, when he comes, will decide which tribe everybody is in and tell us which tribe everybody else is in. But nonetheless, this person that came from an awful situation, Lavdi, from converts that are righteous and uh, convert for the, for the right reason, 
uh the the point is this guy he came out of the wrong place he, he came out of the wrong place and he in essence wasn't part of a tribe and he went out of this uh bedin. he did not like the judgment did not like the judgment did not feel like he's getting the love of a jew that in essence he felt he's supposed to get he's entitled to get and therefore he cursed a kadosh Hu's name cursed a kadosh Hu's name they heard him they arrested him and then they waited for Moshe Rabbeinu to bring the judgment again from Akadosh Baruch Hu of what to do with this person. And the final judgment was that the entire assembly will stone him to death. All of those that heard the blasphemy shall lean their head upon his head first, their hands on his head first, like almost like a uh, they do with the sacrifices. They push their heads down, uh, and then the rest of them start th- stoning him after they throw him off the off the uh two-story building and a whole nightmare situation the reason why they put their hand on uh, on his head first before they stone him is because since this stoning is a result of a of justice of a bad dean in essence each one of the people that heard the uh the the blasphemy itself and are the first ones to hit him are the ones that in essence brought him to trial they're leaning their hands on his head to uh to say that uh your blood is in uh, is in your hand is in your head and uh we will not be punished for your death because you caused this to yourself you did it we're we're doing we did the right thing we're following the Torah your blood is on your hands you're you're the one that caused yourself to death we're not even though we're throwing stones on you this is a mitzvah what we're doing so where's the love there where's the love there as a side note the chidush that I want to give you that I don't believe you've ever heard before, and if you did, Ashrechem, um, is that who is this person? Who is this person that got such treatment? Why did he deserve such a thing? Why did he deserve such a thing, Abutai? This is a uh, extraordinary and. Uh, to keep you in suspense, we'll leave that as the final point for everything that we said. The first and foremost, are we allowed to hate a fellow Jew? Are we allowed to hate somebody? So there's no better place to go than for simple explanations, literal explanations, deep explanations, all in one. You go to the Sefer HaChinuch. Sefer HaChinuch, almost 800 years ago, lists each one of the 613 mitzvot with the source of it in the Torah as well as different reasons behind it above and beyond the simple fact of the reason for the entire Torah which is it's Hashem's will but different what they call tamim different tastes of why different flavors of why this mitzvah is not only in the Torah but it's to our favor it's to uh it's to uh, uh, for the sake of uh, of us, you know, as uh, living a better lives. So mitzvah two hundred and thirty eight says that in the uh, Leviticus chapter nineteen verse seventeen, last week's parasha. Lot you shall not hate your brother in your heart. So the Chinuch says. This is specifically referring to secret hatred. Secret hatred as expressed by the sages of the Sifra who say that Hashem specifically stated that this prohibition of hatred is regarding hatred that is kept in the heart. Hence the reason of why he said hatred in your heart. Now, this is secret hatred. Secret hatred of another person. And it's also mentioned in Gemara Masechet Arachim, page 16b. Now, the reality is that secret hatred doesn't actually mean that nobody knows, like you would normally think. But rather, secret hatred means that the person you hate doesn't know. Which means that even if you have told other people that you hate this person but he himself doesn't know it's still considered secret hatred and you're still violating the Torah 
by hating this person because he doesn't know what are you supposed to do you're supposed to tell him listen you did this 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 and this for me I hate you because of it and give him an opportunity to explain himself and apologize perhaps so the hated person if he knows that uh you hate him then it's called open hatred if he doesn't know then it's called secret hatred if it's secret hatred because he doesn't know that's the specific sin that we're talking about if he does know then it's actually multiple sins what sins are those it's first of all it's you don't love another jew like you're supposed to second of all you have a a sin of bearing a grudge against another jew which is the open hatred and number three you're taking revenge so we're going to go over all of these so first and foremost let's see when a person exhibits open hatred towards his fellow jew and thereby that person is aware that he hates him he doesn't transgress this mitzvah prohibition but rather he transgresses the mitzvah prohibition of you shouldn't take revenge like we says it now even if a person is uh transgressing by uh openly hating another person the uh hatred that's in the heart the secret hatred is much worse than open hatred and in fact it's the worst hatred of all so much so that it's regarded as one of the most re- the, the most repulsive trait in the eyes of any intelligent person the chinuch says because the hatred of the heart causes the greatest evil between people now how do you where do you apply this hatred of another person where and it's it when is it a sin when is it a not a sin rule of thumb the chinuch says a person that's transgressing this mitzvah and harbors hatred in his heart it's only a transgression if it's hatred of an upright jew and it says that the uh this mitzvah is in regards to your achicha your brother your brother in mitzvot meaning if this fellow person if this other person is a uh, desecrating of the torah he desecrates shabbat doesn't keep shabbat he's intermarried he is uh known to be a criminal not only are you uh not sinning by hating him but in fact it's a mitzvah sometimes to hate that person as the gemara in Masech Psachim, page 113b and also the rambam in the ilchot Rotzeach, chapter 13 alakha number 14 said that the prohibition against hating another uh, a person's brother as well as obligated the obligation to love uh one's fellow applies to a person's brother and fellow in an observance of mitzvot which is somebody that's pursuing the uh, which is somebody that's pursuing the torah but someone that's pursuing wickedness and is willfully desecrating the torah desecrating shabbat and things of that nature one is permitted to hate such a person openly or in secret but you have to make sure that that hatred is the hatred of that person's sinful ways and not him personally not him personally that's where a lot of people make a mistake when it comes to rebuking and so on they start hating people specifically that's a mistake you're not supposed to hate the person specifically start making fun of his looks and things of that nature that's wrong you're hating the sin specifically and you're hating him because of that sin that's the uh the key that's important now there's no prohibition whatsoever involved in hatred against evildoers against people that are wicked the chinuch says rather it's a mitzvah to hate them after you have rebuked them many times regarding their sins and yet they refuse to do tshuva from their evil ways it's a mitzvah to hate them at this point as it says in psalm 139 verse 21 Hashem esna, for indeed those who hate you hashem i hate them and uh, uh and those who rise up against you i quarrel so 
Here's a source in regards to exp- brief explanation of the mitzvah of hatred. What about, but it says you have to rebuke them first. You can't just hate somebody just because you saw him driving on Shabbat. At the very least, you have to tell the guy, listen, you know, you're a Jew. Jews are not allowed to drive on Shabbat. If you're a Gentile, you're allowed to drive on Shabbat. If you are, are uh, I, uh, an elephant, you're allowed to drive on Shabbat. If you're a monkey, you're allowed to drive on Shabbat. But if you're a Jew, not allowed to drive on Shabbat. Simple. He doesn't understand, continues to drive on Shabbat. Next time you tell him, listen, I told you not to drive on Shabbat, but maybe I guess I'm going to give you some sources. Let me show you something. And you show the guy a video, you show him something in a book, and so on and so forth. Explain to the guy, now to drive on Shabbat. And you do this multiple times, and the guy simply just ignores everything that you're saying, and in fact laughs at you in your face. That's a person that you've already rebuked, you've showed him, and he continues to ignore everything, cares less, continues to drive on Shabbat, continues to desecrate Hashem's name. Mitzvah to hate such a person. Now, what about the obligation to, to, to rebuke? How, where, how do we know this? We're commanded, the mitzvah number 239, says that we're commanded to rebuke a fellow Jew who has not conducted himself properly, whether it's regarding matters between men and his fellow, which is personal matters, or it's matters between man and God, which is the observance of the Torah and mitzvot. As it's stated, and also same exact place, Leviticus 19.17, which is, you must rebuke your fellow now how do we know the chinuch says how do we know that we have to rebuke a person more than one time how do we know we learn this from the verse itself the see the, the sages of the sifra say the say the uh, the actual verse itself says you must rebuke your fellow why does it you why don't you just say rebuke your fellow why does it say you must rebuke your fellow? To show us that even if you have already reproved your fellow Jew regarding his sin four or five times and he still did not do tshuva, you are obligated to reprove him yet again. And the Torah teaches us that you surely reprove him to such an extent that Gemara Masechet Bava Metziah, page 31a, says, Afilu mea peamim. You shall reprove him even if it's a hundred times. Even if a hundred times are necessary to get him to do tshuva. Now, what about private rebuke, public rebuke? When do we do this? When do we rebuke him publicly? People think that if they see somebody post a picture of, uh, let's say, uh, something immodest on the internet, you're allowed to publicly rebuke him. On the other hand, if a, uh, you uh, somebody cheated you in uh, business, you're allowed to publicly rebuke him. Do a protest outside of his office, or like some of these people are doing, protest with the agunot. You know, they go outside protesting to embarrass the guy because he's sinning and so on and so forth. Are you allowed to do such things? If somebody stole money from you, are you allowed to publicly insult this person and rebuke him because technically he stole from you? stole from you, cheated you, and so on and so forth. You caught your loved one cheating on you. Are you allowed to publicly disseminate this to the whole world? She's a liar, she's a cheater, he's a liar, he's a cheater, he's a adulterer, he's a garbage. Are you allowed to do all these things? Technically, you're saying, listen, he's doing something wrong, I'm rebuking him. What's, What's the problem with it? It's very important to know. The very same place that says, you must rebuke your brother, your fellow, says, Veloti salav chet. But don't let it bring you to a sin. Meaning, don't do it in the wrong way. What's the wrong way? This teaches us that when first setting out to rebuke a sinner, it's proper for a person to rebuke the sinner in private, using a soft language, gentle words, so that the sinner will not become embarrassed. However, there's no doubt that if if there's no doubt that the sinner is not repenting of the sins as a result of this more discreet manner, we may then humiliate the sinner publicly, publicizing his sins, degrading him for it until he returns to the good path and repents. Don't conclude anything yet. This is, again, like I said, brief first few words. If you rebuke them, one, two, three, four, five, however many times, doesn't do tshuva, here he's telling us you can make, go public with it. 
But is it really that simple? No. You have to pay attention to the words, and we're going to get to that in a moment. One of the purposes of the mitzvah of rebuking, Rabotai Yekarim, is actually to bring peace. It's to bring peace. This is confronting another Jew. That is, uh, to, to express your disapproval of his behavior, is how we bring peace between people. Because when a person sins against another person, the wrong party gently reprimands the wrongdoer in private. The wrongdoer will normally will apologize. And then you would accept the apology and will make peace with him. But if the wrong party does not reprimand the wrongdoer, he will inevitably harbor this hatred towards him in the heart. And he will come to harm him soon after or later. As we saw from the story of Avshalom and his brother Amon, where Avshalom hated his brother Amnon because he raped his sister, but he never told him anything about it, and he waited for him a few years until he ended up killing him. So we see here that rebuke is one of the ways that we actually solve a lot of the bigger crimes that ever happened to our nation before they happen because instead of keeping it in your heart and eventually taking revenge when you get that chance you tell the guy you did this wrong to me that's it you give the guy a chance to say i'm sorry or explain himself maybe he's actually right and so on and so forth once you do it that's how you bring peace to am israel if you don't do it you'll definitely end up hating the guy and you'll end up violating that mitzvah that we already talked about so that's why the uh, all the ways of the Torah, when I say that uh, Torah, Darke Noam, that all of the, the ways of the Torah are the ways of pleasantness, that's in essence what it means. It doesn't mean that you just talk nice to everybody all the time, when, you know, regardless of what they do, but rather everything, even the things that seem harsh, are going to bring pleasantness to the world, even if it is a rebuke. Now, among the laws of this mitzvah, is that is there's an obligation of the ichma of, of rebuking a fellow Jew applies until the point of this person striking you. Meaning that a person has the obligation to rebuke over and over again until he's either threatened and some say actually the other person hits him. But if this person is a violent person where you know that if you if you rebuke him, he could surely put your life at risk, then you have no obligation to rebuke that person whatsoever. There's a time that it's a mitzvah to rebuke, there's a time that it's not a mitzvah to rebuke. Now, nevertheless, the, 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 the chinuch says, every person of conscience ought to reflect and be very diligent regarding these matters. He should consider and determine whether there could be a benefit to his words, to the sinner, after he rebukes him for if there's even a possibility that the sinner will listen to his words he's therefore obligated to rebuke him and in the case he's scared or she's scared that this sinner might physically harm them they should have emunah and hashem and he will assist them in battling their enemies who and uh, and have their uh, he should not have their heart be scared in any way because Hashem protects those that love him and destroys all of the people that are wicked and if he succeeds he'll be blessed accordingly as Shlomo Melech says 310 worlds for every person you help him do tshuva on the other hand whoever has within their power the ability to rebuke another person and cause another person to do tshuva by protesting against their sinful actions and does not do it. The Torah tells us that such a person is then themselves held responsible for that sinner's misdeeds. Meaning, you see this person is violating Shabbat, You have the ability to rebuke him and you choose not to every week you see him driving on shabbat you never say a single thing perhaps you're the rabbi of the community or you're the president or you're just simply a known member of the community and you know these people are driving on shabbat and nobody's saying anything you continue staying quiet you are also going to be judged as a mechalel shabbat why you have access to those people you go to the same shul with them for a few years already still see them drive on shabbat you don't say anything 
And Shabbat, they'll count you as a Mechalel Shabbat. This is why it is not worth it to go to a shul that has a large portion of the people desecrating Shabbat. Why? Because even if you have a kosher minyan, let's say you have 10, 20 people that keep Shabbat, but you have 80 people that drive on Shabbat, and the rabbi he is uh you know he's a he's a banker he's a businessman he doesn't care about rebuking people he cares about you know taking their money so he doesn't say a single thing and you're sitting in that kila praying 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 and you know that 80 percent of the kila 50 percent of the kila is driving on shabbat driving on yom kippur does all the sins in the world and no one is saying a single thing and you see them year after year nothing changes you staying quiet is a very very big mistake why either leave the community go somewhere else that has more religious people or start crying foul saying listen Rabutai, i'm telling you because the rabbi doesn't want to do it i'm telling you not allowed to drive on shabbat or give him a cd or send him one of our lectures or tell the rabbi you have to do a shoe about shabbat at least they'll hear it for the first time in their life if they choose to continue desecrating shabbat okay at the very least they heard it but to completely stay nonchalant about it Rabutai, Unfortunately, the Chinuch says, and many other places in the Gemara, Masechet Shabbat, page 54, and also in the uh, Masechet Abu Dazara, and also the Rambam, and many, many uh, of the Poskim say, you see other people sinning and you stay quiet, you in essence become a partner to the sin. So much so, Rabotai, this mitzvah is so important to rebuke people, so much so that even someone that's of lesser stature, has the obligation to rebuke somebody that's a higher stature, meaning you're just a regular member of the community and the uh, president of the community is a desecrator of Shabbat, you have to rebuke him. If he desecrates Shabbat, you have to rebuke him. This actually happened many years ago. One of the greatest rabbis that uh, of recent uh, generations uh, in the Syrian community, Rav Tzion Levi, Allah Shalom, was Kodesh Kodeshim, was a very dear friend of Rav Ovadia, he built an empire, an empire of Kedusha in Panama. But it didn't start off that way. When he came to Panama first, he was very young, young Avrech. They came, they asked him, come be the Nikila. They wanted to build a, uh, the, the, the Jewish community even further. And they brought a Talmit Chacham from Eretz Israel. Rav Ovadia went to Egypt. Rav Tzion Levi went to Panama. Uh, Rav Tzion was in, a, uh, um, in, in Israel, uh, one of the other Chavut, I think Rav Bauch went to uh, Brooklyn, so these Chachamim, each one went to different places to spread the Torah and build communities. So Rav Tzion Levi was fire, fire of zealousness, and he didn't take no for an answer, but it didn't start off that way. Right off the bat, he would read off the Torah on Shabbat and so on. And the president of the community, president of the shul, the one that's the richest, was a Mechalel Shabbat, and uh, but still wanted to get an Aliyah to the Torah. And he brought himself up to the Torah on Shabbat. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do have an Aliyah on Torah. Ratzion Levi says to him, "No, you're not gonna have an Aliyah." What do you mean? I'm, I'm the president for two, so, all these years. What do you mean? I'm, you're not going to have an aliyah. As long as I'm here, you're not going to have an aliyah. You violate Shabbat, you're not going to have an aliyah. He says, you know what I'm, who I am? Says, I listen to Hashem. He says, if you don't give me an aliyah, you know what I'm going to do to you? He says, how about this? Not only you're not going to get an aliyah, but as long as you're sitting in here, I'm not going to read from the Torah at all. The guy didn't know where to bury himself from the embarrassment and the anger that he had. The whole keila is shaking. Who is this young little Avrech think he is talking to the president of the community like this? Not going to read from the Torah as long as he's here. From the anger, the president walked out and Rav Tzion Levi continued reading from the Torah. After he finished, he finished the prayer, went home and told his wife, after Shabbat, we should pack our bags because this is probably the end. We're going to fire him. Motzei Shabbat came, Avdalah, everything. 
and they started packing. Suddenly they hear a knock on the wall on the on the door. Open the door, sees all of the head people of the community are there. The entire community showed up to his house, to the rabbi's house, with the president in front. He's thinking they're gonna what they're gonna lynch him. He's in a foreign country in Panama. It's not like he's got uh, anywhere to go. But as you would have it, because the Torah promises us, it's those that fear Hashem, Dvarav Nishmaim, their words will be heard. The president and the entire Keilah came to Rav Tzion Levi and says, Kvod Rav, I came here to say, I'm sorry. You are right. From now on, Whatever you say, that's what we're going to do. And that's how Rav Tzion Levi built an empire of Kedusha. An empire of Kedusha in the Syrian community that impacted it all over the world, not just there. Started that way. Why? He stood up for the Emet when it didn't make sense to anybody. Didn't make sense to anybody. So Rabotai, even someone that's in a low level has this obligation. A woman, a man, has this obligation. And a person that does not fulfill this mitzvah has violated the mitzvah obligation and is considered among the reshaim. person that does not rebuke people in some way or another, directly rebuking them or indirectly rebuking them. You don't have to always talk to people. You can just simply share a lecture with them that talks about their sins. You see that they're desecrating Shabbat. You see that they're intermarried. You see that they're eating non-kosher. Final lecture. From a fiery speaker that wakes up people that are spiritually dead send it to them give it to them on a regular basis do your best to help them that's a rebuke invite them to a lecture that's a rebuke get them to at least find out what they admit is but staying quiet makes the person that's not rebuking the chinuch says among the reshaim mikat a reshaim shosim ken Think that you keep Shabbat, that's enough. You think that because you give stock, that's enough. It's not enough. Why? We're obligated. Obligated. So what about embarrassing them? Okay, the guy desecrates Shabbat, I can embarrass him. Rabotai here. This is a very, very important part of the teaching. Because we know that once who a person, the mitzvah number 240, prohibition of embarrassing a fellow Jew. From here we learn that a person that a person that publicly embarrasses another Jew and has no share of the world to come. But you just said you're allowed to publicly embarrass. When are you allowed to publicly embarrass again? After you rebuke once, twice, three times, four times, ten times. When are you allowed to go public with this? Listen to this. It's a very, very important teaching. The Chinuch says in Mitzvah 240, in regards to the laws of embarrassing a fellow Jew in public, that the sages of blessed memory say that we were not warned against humiliating a fellow Jew in all situations of rebuke. Rather, only when the rebuke pertains to matter that are between a man and his fellow, meaning there's personal grievances, for which a person reprimands another person who has wronged him personally. When attempting this type of rebuke, one must be careful never to humiliate another person in public even after confronting him in private to no avail. However, regarding heavenly matters, that is that rebuking a sinner for being a derelict when it comes to mitzvot, desecrate Shabbat, uh, and so on and so forth. If the sinner does not do tshuva as a result of the rebuke initially attempted in private, it is a mitzvah to embarrass him in public and to publicize his sin and to disgrace him and condemn him until he returns to the path of good, as was the practice of the prophets towards the sinners of Am Yisrael. Here, Rabotai, is the key secret. When are we allowed to publicly embarrass people? When are we forbidden from embarrassing people? If it is an issue between one person and another, he wronged you, you wronged him, it's never allowed to go in public. Never. There's no amount of times 
never allowed to go public all of these people that are doing public protest about somebody that wronged them stole from them and so on it's not a good idea why you're even though you have been wrong you are now doing even more wrong than them you're doing even more wrong than them. personal issues stays private even after a hundred personal rebukes but when it comes to desecration of the Torah desecration of Hashem's name even after a single rebuke you see that he's simply ignoring you you are allowed to go public and in fact it's a mitzvah to go public and embarrass him in public that's why the Shukhan Aruch says someone that speaks during the parent shul you're rebuking in private not doesn't listen to you mitzvah to publicly embarrass him in front of everybody disgrace him insult him and so on it's until he gets the point stops talking in shul why it's uh, it's a this is too big of a sin the shulchan Aruch says why is it too big of a sin everybody in the kilas prayers are being put on hold because this guy is talking in shul so therefore it's too big of a sin for him to even pay for you have to shake the ground but that's because this is a not a person this is not one person to another type of sin this is a desecration of Torah it's Chilul Hashem when you talk in Shul it's Chilul Hashem so that's Abutai why you're allowed to publicly embarrass such a person now what about taking revenge this guy did something to you you're allowed to take revenge mitzvah number 241 also versed based on the verse uh, Leviticus 1918 you shall not take revenge and you shall not bear a grudge against the members of your people where in essence this is the uh, the chinuch says this is a case one is not uh a person does not have to actually do something openly actively in order to be one that's taking revenge why it's just like it gives the example if somebody came to you and said listen can I borrow a uh you came to a person and said, can I borrow a hammer and he says no and you know he has three hammers in the house no no I don't have okay next day he comes to you he says can I borrow a uh, knife and you say no that's revenge yeah but he did it to me so what if he did it to you this is because he's a rasha doesn't mean you're allowed to be a rasha even more so even more so Rabotai, if a uh, person says listen I'll give you my knife but that's because I don't do what you did I don't do what you did even though you didn't give me the hammer even though you had three of them I'm still gonna give you my knife guess what it's not only it's not a mitzvah you have just made a sin of holding a grudge now what about the guy that got embarrassed he talked bad about you while you were gone you went down you went out of town by the time you came back there was posters all over the street that you are like uh, the worst person on planet earth and you didn't do any of this stuff are you allowed to keep a grudge against this guy he technically did bad to you right Torah says not allowed to take revenge not allowed to keep a grudge why Chinuch gives the explanation of a lifetime it was worth it to come to the world just to listen to this part the purpose of this mitzvah the chinuch says is the person must know intellectually that instead of focusing on taking revenge and how come he did this to me and how come she did this to me and how could she say this and how could he say this and so on and so forth instead they should use the torah as a tool to remind them to internalize what's happening in their life at that moment when they're being embarrassed or they were embarrassed or they were hurt by somebody internalize this into their consciousness the idea that everything that is happening to them whether it's good or it's bad is orchestrated specifically by a kadosh baruch Hu himself and it's not from the person it is done it is brought to you by hashem himself may his name be blessed where he's simply using the hands of men to do his will everything is the will of a kadosh Hu. this guy was simply used to bring you embarrassment that a kadosh Hu signed off on so therefore 
when a person causes a, you pain and suffering you must realize that it's your own sins that cause the suffering and Hashem may his name be blessed decree this injury or suffering upon you because of that and you must not focus your thoughts upon exacting revenge against the person that harmed you since that person is not really the true cause of your suffering he's simply a tool that a Baruch Hu is using your sins are the cause you are the cause of your suffering not him and a person should instead focus his thoughts and his feelings on doing tshuva just like David Melech that was cursed by Shimi ben Gira in front of all of his people it says in the book of Samuel's 2 chapter 16 verse 11 leave him and let him curse for Hashem blessed be he has told him to that David Melech blamed the matter on his own sin rather than on the antagonist Shimi ben Gira And a person should simply take this into account that all of the suffering that you have that you think that she caused you and he caused you you caused you to yourself there's no reason for you to be mad at these people now surely they'll be punished for whatever they're doing and why Hashem used them as a tool to hurt another person but nonetheless you shouldn't be mad at them at all there's no reason for you to take revenge why you are the reason you are doing something for HaKadosh Baruch Hu to bring you this something as a result if you did good you would have gone good if you did bad you're getting bad simple simple furthermore is a great benefit to be found in the fulfillment of this mitzvah the chinuch says why it serves to put a stop to all fighting and to wipe away all enmity in people's hearts but ultimately it'll bring peace to Am Yisrael. why because once you know that all bad that happens to you that's coming from the mouth and actions of other people is your fault and not theirs they're just being used as tools you can't fight the hammer for hitting you in the head it's a hammer you can't be upset at the shark for biting you it's a shark that's what they do you have to be upset at yourself how come I got myself to this point therefore once you understand it's not their fault but rather your fault there's nothing to take revenge over there's nothing to be vengeful about and the reality is Rabotai, that if a person violates this mitzvah and continues to bear a grudge against this fellow Jew again always remember fellow Jew person that keeps mitzvah not a wicked person that desecrates the Torah he keeps the grudge against his fellow Jew he now becomes the cause of even more pitfalls and more damage that will happen to his life meaning this guy said some Lashon about you and publicized that you are a pedophile publicized that you're a terrible person publicized that you're a thief publicized that you're whatever you are okay now surely he's gonna get punished by Hashem surely he needs to say I'm sorry but you regardless of whether he says I'm sorry or not not allowed to have any grudge against them or take revenge against them in any way shape or form because it's all your fault for your sins that you've done which means that if you still keep a grudge against this person you say I hate this guy guess what you are now bringing even more bad to your life because you're now making even more sins you already made enough sins to bring the current embarrassment to your life now you're making even more sins to bring even worse things to you and that's what the chinuch says you now become the cause of extensive pitfalls to yourself because of the further sin and instead of doing tshuva instead of doing tshuva the guy is hating people and that's why mitzvah number 242 says you should not bear a grudge against members of your people that we're not we're commanded not to bear a grudge we're prohibited against bearing a harboring in our hearts 
wrong that other Jews of fellow Jews have done to us again remember always observant Jews if they're not observant none of this stuff relates to them unfortunately because they're excluding themselves from the nation now all of this comes from the teachings that we talked about loving your fellow Jew mitzvah number 243 in the chinuch says is an obligation to love each and every fellow Jew with the love that one has for himself that's to say that we must be concerned for every single Jew and their property you should care about his house his well-being as much as you care about your house very very difficult mitzvah because most people are selfish point being is that you're no there's certain rules of thumb don't do things that uh you don't want people to do to you very simple very logical now rabbi akiva says you shall love your fellow jew as yourself this is a great principle in a torah comes originally from hillel what is that to say what does that mean that the entire torah is just love everybody no says the chinuch and this is the real meaning that's why the khatam sofer brought the rebuke to everybody to say that everybody that's turning the torah into simply their own tool to you know to fix their own life and make their community lovey-dovey even though half the people don't keep anything the other half are not even sure of everything and they're but they're all friendly that's not loving am Yisrael. that's not loving each other that's not loving that's not the torah even if you're friendly with each other you help each other out that's not loving each other if you loved each other you would worry about each other's eternity if you're not worried about each other's eternity and you only care about being friends and having dinners together that's loving yourself so what does it mean to love and love love am Yisrael, love each other it's a big uh, principle in the torah that's to say says the sefer chinuch that many of the mitzvot in the torah hence the ones we just spoke about for the last hour depend on the fulfillment of this very mitzvah of loving each other because one who loves his fellow as he loves himself is not going to steal from him is not going to commit adultery with his wife is not going to defraud him financially is not going to hurt him ver- verbally and then uh, cause him any type of lashonara and rechilut and hurt him in any way he's not going to harm him many of the commandments depend upon the fulfillment of this mitzvah of loving your brother that's what it means that it's a big klal in the torah it's a big principle in the torah not that it's the entire torah is that you cannot not hate your brother if you love him you know, you cannot hate your brother if you love him it's not possible to love him you cannot keep a grudge if you love him you understand so that's the key if you if you don't love him surely you're going to keep a grudge surely you're going to do all these other things so a person needs to know that when you're bringing rebuke when those Jewish people went to the Bedin and rebuked their fellow Jew that came from a rape and he didn't like it and he went to the Bedin with them and the Bedin of Moshe Rabbeinu said you are wrong you're not part of any tribe and he didn't like it and he then cursed Hashem them killing him they were fulfilling the justice but now we have to see a little bit more color from our sages of why is he in the first place why did this all happen because the chinuch says instead of being upset at everybody else for telling you you're not part of the klali sled because you came from rape instead of being upset at everybody for taking to the bedin and fulfilling the law instead of being upset for being in a circumstance that you're in you should reflect on yourself and see why am i in this situation darizal says that the tum'a of the world the tum'a of the world the impurity that came into the world is in the control of the sitra acha that was given in human form was given to a sav the nation of a sav Darizal says in Shara Gilgulim. Darizal says in Shara Gilgulim, Esav, the source of all Tuma, Kadosh Baruch Hu says, Et Esav Saneti, I hate Esav, because he knew the truth. 
He knew he needed to do tshuva. He knew just as much as Yaakov Avinu, but he still chose to stick to his own desire and his own ego and his own everything. He is now in control of the Tumah. He's in Genom. He's going to be punished and so on and so forth. But it doesn't just end. Esau didn't end with his death. Why? Because he was given a power, the Tumah, the impurity. This is why Rabotai Karim in Sefer Shari Gilgulim, the gate of reincarnation by the Arizal, the Arizal says, Esav reincarnated into Yoshke, Jesus of Nazareth. Why? Just like Esav knew the truth and desecrated it in any way, so did Jesus know the truth that desecrated it anyway. Just like Esau had the opportunity to be one of the greatest people that ever lived, Jesus had the opportunity to have the, to be one of the greatest people that ever lived. They both lost that opportunity and both are doomed for eternity. But there still remains a big question. The time period between Esau and Jesus is a huge amount of time. You're talking about something almost like 2,000 years. Hashem waited 2,000 years? No. Comes the Sefer Shefrir Tzedek by Rabbi Raphael Volfovitz, one of the Rishonim. And he says in the Sefer that just like the Tuma of Paro went into the ocean, because it was too much for the for the world to contain it. It had to go into uh, the, the Tuma that Paro in Egypt had was uh, 90% of the world's impurity. Such is the Tuma of Christianity. Too much for the world to contain. It had to go into a certain person. Couldn't just be in Never Never Land. It had to go somewhere. It couldn't be a, such a long period of going from the impurity of Esav waiting all the way to Yoshke, all the way to Jesus. Had to go somewhere else. Where did it go? It went to, from Esav to the son of Shulamit in this week's parasha. Esav reincarnated as the son of Shulamit, the blasphemer, who cursed Hashem because he did not like the law did not like the deen of the bedin and just like the blasphemer's mother brought him to the world because of our immodesty and immorality when he got reincarnated he got reincarnated from also a sinful way where the uh mary magdalene also cheated on her husband and then ended up going with some goy joseph and then said, no, this is a birth, uh, God impregnated me, it was all the nonsense that they say. Mary Magdalene was a prostitute zona. She got pregnant, but didn't want to get stoned by everybody. So what did she do? She said, it's a immaculate conception nonsense. The reality is, just like Jesus came from a zona, the previous carnation also was a zona, a person that unfortunately did something terrible. And Shulamit acted something, did something terrible. And that's why the reincarnation shows that there is justice in the world. There is justice in the world because they both had sinful actions that were, that stemmed from immodesty. You see, Rabotai, a person that focuses on themselves and how the world is wronging them, can end up just like the blasphemer and will only bring more damage to their life. Just like the Chinuch says, a person that focuses on themselves need to do tshuva, realizes that all of the suffering they have is because of their own actions, not somebody else's actions. Yeah, but he said it to me. So what he said it to me? He's just a pawn that Hashem is using to talk to you because you're not Moshe Rabbeinu. He's not going to talk to you face to face. Yeah, but she said it to me and she did it to me and she got me fired. No, no. Hashem got you fired. He's just using her to do it. 
when a person understands that all suffering that come to their life is because of their actions automatically it brings favor brings their situation to a place of favorness in the eyes of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and automatically things start moving in the right direction it may not be as quickly as you would like but admitting that it's your need to do tshuva is the first step of doing tshuva this rabotai is one of the failures of a sav that did not stop with a sav but continued with the son of the black the blasphemer the son of shulamit and continued even further with Jesus of Nazareth when he was rebuked by his rabbi and instead of apologizing the right way and doing what he was supposed to now I had things have to be my way and that's why it says in the Gemara Reshaim even al play Genom lo asim tshuva the wicked even at the gate of Genom do not do tshuva why I have to be right somewhere they say you're not right Habibi you're wrong again and again and again even if it's multiple reincarnations you'll still remain wrong and the Torah will stay 100 percent true this Rabotai I believe is a little bit of insight about a lot of things that I think in Bezat Hashem if not give you Chizuk at least it gave me some so at least one of us benefit but I think that uh from uh, some of the comments that I'm seeing it looks like We're getting some good feedback, Baruch Hashem.